Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's broadcast, The Necessity of Extractable and Leachable Qualifications for Lyophilized Drug Products, Some Fallacies Addressed. I'm Rita Peters, Editorial Director of Pharmaceutical Technology, and I'll be moderating today's event. We're pleased to bring this webcast presented by Pharmaceutical Technology and sponsored by Nelson Labs. I'd like to share a statement from our sponsor. Nelson Labs, a Soterra health company, is the industry-leading provider of global lab testing and expert advisory services. The company performs microbiological and analytical laboratory tests across the medical device, pharmaceutical, and tissue industries. Nelson Labs is regarded as a best-in-class partner with a strong track record of collaborating with customers to solve complex issues. I have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small square icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or you can hover your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and drag the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing the presentation, click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. Now I'd like to welcome today's speaker. Piet Christians received a doctorate from the Analytical Chemistry Department of the University of Leuven, Belgium in 1991. From 1992 to 1997, he was lab manager in two contract research organizations. From 1997 to 2000, he worked as an independent consultant with Shell Chemical Company in Houston, Texas, working on hydrogenated tri-block copolymers. Since 2001, Piet has held the position of scientific director at Nelson Labs Europe, where he develops analytical methods and protocols for both extractables and leachable studies for the pharmaceutical and medical industries. He oversees all lab operations at Nelson Labs Europe and also gives support to business development and R&D. So thank you for joining us today. I'm gonna to turn the presentation over to you. First, I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar, and I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak and also for the flawless uh, organization of the event. I am Piet Christians. I'm the scientific director of Nelson Labs Europe, and Nelson Labs Europe is a CRO that is specialized in performing ENL uh, qualifications for a wide variety of dosage forms, as well as uh, for uh, chemical characterization of medical devices. And today I will talk about the necessity of extractable and leachable qualifications for lyophilized drug products. And I will try to explain why there's such a debate around extractable and leachable qualifications, the necessity of it, and how deep you need to go. Um, based upon some of the observations that we had when performing uh, ENL qualifications for lyophilized drug products. I will also touch upon uh, the fallacies that are commonly um, present uh, when looking at the life life drug products, and that is mainly uh, based upon the potential interaction between the composing parts of the primary packaging and the life life drug product itself. But before we go to the presentation, I would like to go over uh, the table of contact with you. First, um, in the first part, we will have a look at uh, the primary packaging of the lyo powder and also the packaging of um, the reconstitution solution and administration devices. What is it? Um, just to visualize it. In the second part, we will zoom in on the primary packaging, which is typically um, a file with a rubber stopper. And what are the US and European uh, guidelines tell us to do in terms of qualification for extractables and leachables? In part three, we will take a step back, not talking specifically on um, 
um, life life structure a bit more in general and the general flow of an acceptable and legible evaluation. In part four, we will talk about the interaction mechanism between the LIO drug product and its primary packaging, and that mechanism is based upon our guessing. In part five, we will have a look at uh, how to set up legible testing and what are some additional considerations and uh, hurdles to be taken when you're designing this kind of legible uh, approach. Part six is also something very typical you will encounter when you perform leachable studies on LIO drug products, and these are potentially the reactive leachables that you will encounter. And in the last part, we will have a look at uh, what you can do to minimize the interaction between the LIO cake and a stopper. First, uh, what are we talking about when we're talking about the LIO containers and the administration devices? Um, Typically, you can uh, divide it into three subcategories. You have the primary packaging itself, which is typically a vial, a glass vial, and a rubber stopper. The rubber stopper is selected because of its low residual moisture content and the low uh, water vapor transmission, because you want to keep the lyo cake as dry as possible because of stability issues. A second type of container in these kinds of applications is the reconstitution solution container. This is typically a vial or a pre-filled syringe. And once you have um, reconstituted the lifelized drug product, then you need to administer it to a patient and therefore you use a drug administration set. It could be um, a disposable syringe, it could be an uh, IV bag uh, or a pump system with administration tubing. The last part will not be discussed in detail in this presentation. Uh, however, there are other presentations on combination products and medical devices that you can consult on our website. So let's first zoom in on uh, what the US and the European uh, guidelines tell us in terms of qualification of the primary packaging uh, of a LIO drug product. And we'll first have a look at the situation in the US. Um, here, I would like to refer to this table that ranks the packaging concerns based upon the likelihood of packaging component dosage form interaction and the degree of concern associated with the route of administration. I think we all agree that for um, injectables or parental application that the degree of concern associated uh, with the route of administration is the highest. Uh, because you inject the drug product, you take away the barrier of the skin, and uh, all impurities, whether they are toxic or not, will be introduced in full into the body and may uh, cause some potential systemic effects, toxic effects. Um, the first um, time this table appeared was in the um, original um, FDA guidance for industry in 1999, the container closure systems for packaging human drugs and biologics. But it was also, uh, the same table was um, taken into the USP 1664 on leachables, that was in 2015, with some slight modifications. And it has some implications for parental applications, as you can see that the um, injections and injectable suspensions went from the likelihood of packaging component dosage form interaction, potentially from a high likelihood to a medium uh, likelihood, which is understandable from the perspective that most um, injectables are aqueous based. And you would expect that from an um, interaction point of view that aqueous based drug products have a lower type of interaction with their materials than a solvent based uh, um, drug product. However, you have those non-aqueous uh, based um, injectables or parental applications. And there I would say that the uh, likelihood of packaging component dosage form interaction is still high. What also changed in the USP 1664 is that uh, for sterile powders and powders for injection, that the likelihood of packaging uh, dosage form interaction moved from medium to low. And that has something to do with the 
uh, appreciation of how the drug product could interact with the components of the primary packaging. So uh, the low likelihood of packaging drug product interaction for lyophilized uh, drug products is based upon the observation that the interaction between the solid, which is the lyo cake, and the material, which is typically the rubber stopper, is limited. And uh, that there's limited direct contact, certainly when the vial is in an upright position between the lyo cake and the rubber closure. However, as you will see in one of the next uh, parts of this presentation, um, the interaction mechanism between the live cake and the components may not be based upon a direct contact mechanism. You also need to be careful of rationalizing the uh, live application as being non-critical and not performing anything in terms of ENL uh, qualifications. How is the situation in Europe? Here, I would like to refer to the EMA uh, guideline on plastic immediate packaging materials of 2005. In, on page 11 of that uh, document, you will find this decision tree. And you can see that for uh, parental applications, uh, for solid dosage forms, you need to generate general information, uh, specification and uh, interaction studies if necessary. And in the body of the text, uh, it specifies that uh, for solid active substances or solid dosage forms, the risk of interaction is low and generally does not require an interaction study. Solid dosage forms, uh, however, uh, intended for inhalation or parental use, for instance, life life drug products, products may need uh, to have interaction studies. Uh, between the packaging material and the components of the formulation. So here too, um, they leave you a little bit uh, in the middle of whether it is necessary or not. And that's uh, what I want to conclude with when looking at the regulatory guidance is that there's some kind of potential ambiguity in terms of um, what the need is to perform such a qualification and the subsequent depth of an uh, extractable and leachable uh, evaluation for uh, live containers. Now, like I said, I would like to take one step back here, not talking about uh, live applications in, uh, in specific, but more in general. Look at the flow of an extractable and leachable assessment, because that will be the basis that we will build on later on. So how does the general flow of an extractable and leachable study look like for any uh, type of um, dosage form? Is that it is some kind of combination of chemistry and toxicology. And you could um, look at it as four basic questions that need to be answered. The first question is, what are the chemical impurities in the packaging? That is, of course, um, what you want to solve. That's the question you want to solve by performing an extraction study. And you can find some guidance in the USP uh, 1663, for instance. Here, the focus will be on identification because it's only if you identify those compounds that you can link the identity of the compound uh, to its relevant toxicological information. In a second step, um, you try to look at all the compounds that you have identified and uh, detected and reported in your extraction study, which can be something like between 20 and 100 compounds, and you do some kind of basic um, assessment on them. That's not a full in-depth um, toxicological assessment. It's more a kind of a hazard assessment in combination with how high is the concentration in the material and what is the likelihood that this compound will migrate out of the material into the drug product. In step number three, you will focus on those uh, compounds of concern that were identified in step number two and you design a leachable study um, and some guidance can be found in the USP 1664. And here the focus is really on quantify, uh, quantitation. Um, you want to quantify those compounds as good as possible because in step number four, 
you need to have a look at the risk to the patient. And here the dose to the patient will be very important. So that's why a leachable study needs to be quantitative. So um, at the end, uh, the best possible outcome is that after your risk evaluation, the toxicological evaluation of the leachables, that no compounds will be flagged or will be of concern. In addition um, to some of the uh, considerations that you can find in the USP 1663 and 1664, I would like to share also um, this information. It's a video of Dan Mellon, who is a reviewer, um, a tox reviewer with the FDA, CEDAR. And uh, that uh, video um, explains the seven common pitfalls that you can uh, find as a reviewer in extractable and leachable submissions. The first one is uh, that uh, you need to identify compounds above the qualification threshold. This is typically 1.5 micrograms per day for chronic treatments and 5 micrograms per day for non-chronic treatments. The use of inappropriate thresholds, the uh, inadequate sensitivity of the detection methods. That means that your um, evaluation level, for instance, the AET or the PDE level needs to be higher than the uh, limit of quantification. You also need to examine trends for leachables, um, sometimes uh, inadequate toxicological uh, justifications are given. And you also need to uh, look at um, how or explain how extractables data were used to design the leachable assessment. And then the last uh, consideration, um, you need to make the correlation between extractables and leachables, which will be very important in one of the next parts of a presentation. Now, coming to the mechanism uh, of interaction between the LIO drug product and its primary packaging, that mechanism is based upon outgassing. Now, um, this picture represents the vial of, so a LIO vial of the, uh, which contains the LIO cake. And you can see that the rubber is on top of the vial and the layer cake is, at the, is on the bottom of the vial. So in terms of interaction, if you would assume that there's a direct contact necessary to have some kind of interaction, you would say, in this case, no interaction will take place. However, you have to know that uh, rubbers contain a whole diverse uh, number of compounds um, they may be impurities of the ingredients of the rubber. They may be formed during the, the, the curing process. And some of those are volatile or semi-volatile. And what, what is happening that is that over time, some of those compounds may be released or will be released from the rubber and they will fly around into the inner volume of the vial. And when they encounter, um, the lyo cake, which is typically very dry and has a very high surface area, they will be absorbed onto the lyo cake. In the next slide, uh, we will zoom a little bit deeper on in that. So here again, you have the rubber stopper, which contains a whole uh, number of um, volatile and semi-volatile compounds, and they will start to uh, evaporate or outgas uh, from the rubber stopper. And once they encounter or collide onto the lyo cake, they will absorb and they will stick to the surface of the lyo cake. Not only uh, will that happen, but in certain cases, and we will address that in one of the later parts of the presentation, they will start to uh, have chemical reactions with the uh, lyo drug products. It could be with the API, it could be with the excipient or an impurity or whatever. So you will see a mix of uh, adsorption onto the surface, then some reactive leachables. But we need to stress here or need to emphasize that the extent of the outgassing will depend upon the quality and the grade of the rubber. If you have a high quality grade, you can expect that not too much will 
outgas from the rubber. If it's an older type of rubber, there potentially you see more coming out. Now, what do you, what do you do uh, afterwards? After um, the Lyo drug product has been stored for a number of months or years is you reconstitute the drug product. So you add the reconstitution solution in the vial and that creates some kind of solubilization of all the adsorbed leachables uh, in the reconstitution solution. And those will be mainly volatile and semi-volatile organic compounds. However, on the right-hand side, you also see that uh, in the procedure, because you want to make sure that the lyo cake is, is uh, fully dissolved, you shake it. That means that that solution will come uh, in contact with the primary packaging, although there will be a short-term interact, uh, short-term contact between the uh, reconstituted drug product and the lyo vial, there will be one. And that means that also non-volatile compounds, metals and ions, ions potentially may be released uh, from the materials of construction uh, of the primary packaging into the reconstituted solution. When we're looking at the basic analytical techniques uh, that will be used for uh, characterizing, for instance, the rubber stopper from an extractable perspective, the volatile organic compounds and the semi-volatile organic compounds, which will be studied with Headspace, GCMS and GCMS, will mainly focus at those compounds that you will expect uh, after long-term storage in the lyobile while the non-volatile compounds, the metals and the ions, will focus on those uh, compounds that potentially may be released during the short-term contact uh, of reconstitution. So that means uh, actually that the approach for an extraction study will not be substantially different uh, for a LIO application compared to a uh, liquid small volume parental application. Now, looking at the different steps of an extraction study, um, what you want to do is first discover all compounds that are present. For instance, the, the rubber uh, of the um, lyovile. Not only do you want to discover them, but you want to evaluate them when they are above a certain toxicological threshold, for instance, the AET, and you want to identify them. Like I said, you need to identify them because that is the only way to link the identity of the compound to the toxicological information. And that allows you to perform some kind of hazard assessment uh, in a first stage. You also want to semi-quantify uh, all those compounds in the material. Uh, it's not really an in-depth analytical study, but you need to give some kind of order of magnitude uh, in terms of what the concentration of those extractables will be. In the uh, subsequent leachable study, for instance, for the primary packaging, but for the reconstitution solution container, that's the same situation. You have also different considerations, so you need to um, study those long-term um, storage conditions, but uh, preferably also the accelerated condition. You monitor uh, those compounds that were identified in the initial uh, risk or hazard assessment, and you want to see if some of those leachables are uh, introduced into the drug product at concentrations above the AET. You do that with different time points because you need to evaluate trends. Um, I'm referring to the um, uh, video of Dan Mellon here. Using quantitative methods because at the end you want to do um, a final tox assessment. And um, you also need to add a screening step because sometimes unexpected things happen. But that will be explained later on. Coming back to the administration devices, um, I don't want to spend too much time on those. So we're talking about the disposable syringe and IV bag uh, uh, pump system, uh, an administration set or a tubing system. 
Here, um, all those uh, devices that will be used to administer the reconstituted drug product to the patient will be, the contact will be transient or short term. And uh, there will be no long term uh, accumulation of those um, uh, compounds that will be released. But potentially, you will see some volatiles, semi volatiles, non volatiles, and metals being introduced during the short term contact uh, with the uh, administration devices. These devices could be classified as a medical device or as a combination product. And the approaches in terms of qualification, what you need to do will be different. Uh, however, like I said, this will not be addressed in this uh, webinar. Now, um, when considering a leachable study for a lifelike drug product, there are some considerations that you need to take into account and some hurdles to be taken uh, when designing such a leachable study. And I will try to explain that with, um, again, taking one step back, how one of the aspects of a leachable study is looking like. So in a leachable study design, what you want to do is you want to assess all differential peaks in some kind of comparative assessment between the aged drug product in the primary packaging and the aged blank drug product that had no container closure exposure. So that is that age blank uh, serves as some kind of baseline. And that is represented in the chromatogram. So the upright chromatogram is the drug product that was stored uh, long-term in the packaging. And the inverted chromatogram is the blank drug product. So what you want to do in this kind of assessment is look at all differential peaks that are in the upright chromatogram, but not being present in the inverted chromatogram. And I have indicated one here, just to make my point. So that is clearly eligible. So um, why is that important to be able to do that is at the end, you want to, or you need to make some kind of correlation between the extractables and the legibles. So you should be uh, sure that what you report is actually a legible that has been introduced in the drug product as a consequence of the contact with the primary packaging. Now, um, with this slide, we want to explore what a good blank solution is and what the um, challenge for life life drug products is. So a good blank solution is uh, a leachables free drug product. So that means that it should be a drug product that was not in contact with the primary packaging. It should preferably be of the same drug product batch as the contact uh, sample. And it should be put on controlled storage uh, together with the contact samples because you want to assure that the degradation of the drug product is the same both in the blank as well as in your sample uh, to be tested for the leachables. Now, um, what is the problem with the uh, life life drug products is that the production um, of a um, life life drug product is in the vial itself. So the freeze drying step that is taking place of the liquid uh, Lyo drug product in the freeze dryer is performed in the vial itself. So it is impossible to produce a lyophilized drug product without its primary packaging. So that makes that you do not have any blank as you would have, as was indicated for a small volume parental, for instance, uh, that is liquid based. Now, um, okay, you could say whatever. Um, there is no blank, so let's screen anyway. 
and that would be the conclusion. Um, so you have potentially a chromatogram in this case of uh, 75 organic impurities. The question now is which one of those is actually the result of the contact with the primary packaging? Which one is eligible? So this is hard to, to, to define based upon this chromatogram. And that is really a challenge. So we need to explore how we could get some kind of uh, blank that could be, used, could be used as some kind of baseline for the evaluation. So we know the challenge. Uh, there's no true blank uh, for the drug product that is available, but there are some potential solutions. The first potential solution is um, use the T0 as the blank baseline throughout the complete study. That may have some value, however, it has uh, disadvantages. Uh, some compounds may already be present after a short-term contact. Um, typically, you do not analyze um, a Lyo container uh, filled with a Lyo product, you know, after immediately after um, the, the, the filling and uh, freeze drying, but there are some days or weeks in between. And also the stability and degradation of the drug product will not be accounted for. So in conclusion, it's not a preferred option, although it may have some value. Using the upright position as a reference to the inverted position, um, that was one of the fallacies that also existed uh, in previous times. Of course, um, we have explained the migration mechanism, which is not based upon material contact, but is, is uh, based upon the outgassing mechanism. Um, we have seen in our studies that the concentration of leachables is independent of the position of the vial, whether it is upright or inverted, the concentration of the leachables stays the same. So in that case, that is certainly not an option. Another possibility is to use a lab prepared and freshly prepared drug product containing all the ingredients of the uh, reconstituted drug product. Here, the disadvantage is that some of the volatile impurities may be present in the prepared drug product, but may not be in the drug product itself because the lyophilization step or the freeze drying step is under a vacuum. And um, some of those volatile compounds may be uh, removed already during that step. Also, the degradation of the drug product uh, may be different in a liquid form compared to in a, in a freeze dried or in a completely uh, dry form. So that is also something to watch out for. It is a possibility, like the uh, last option is, is emptying a Lyo vial right after manufacturing and storing uh, it in, in a dry Lyo uh, environment. Um, here, the problem is you need to try to find the right container for long-term storage of that blank, making sure that all uh, moisture is kept out. And uh, how do you keep your uh, Lyo drug product dry over the shelf life of the drug product. So that is, these are the hurdles that need to be taken. So um, there's no perfect solution. However, you know, depending upon the situation and what is available in each situation or what would be uh, an option, there are some possibilities that you could uh, consider. In any way, um, when you're considering a legible study design for a lifelike drug product, um, you need to rely more on targeted analysis with quantitative methods than you need to do in any other uh, drug product. However, because of a, a variety of reasons, um, and that will be explained in the next part, you also need to, to add a screening step. The question is, how do you screen uh, because I explained that in one of my previous slides, that that may be a problem. So what you could do is you look at the compounds that you encountered in your extraction study and you verify if you could see those compounds also being released um, via outgassing from the rubber into your lyocake. Or alternatively, if you have 
a well-populated database, for instance, you could do some kind of screening and look at the compounds that potentially could be relevant uh, in terms of um, reporting uh, as a potential uh, leachable. Or um, you could also report all differential compounds from the, the blank that you uh, um, selected. The advantage is you can look at uh, unexpected leachables or reactive leachables. The disadvantage is that potentially you may re, uh, report uh, drug product degradation compounds. So that is certainly something to watch out for. In any way, uh, whatever you choose, you need to evaluate trends. And there, for instance, the T0 could assist you with. You need to evaluate acceptable and leachable correlations. And it, there's a strong suggestion from my side to also evaluate the reactivity of certain leachables with the drug product. Now, coming to the reactive leachables, this is something that we have observed with lyophilized drug product in quite some cases. When I look at when we encounter reactive leachables, it is most occurring with uh, lyophilized drug products. Um, the reason why that is the case is not really well understood right now. We assume that the reaction uh, environment is favorable. The dry um, cake, the lyo cake, that that is favorable for uh, organic reactions to take place. But at this moment, we uh, are not sure about the real uh, mechanism there. When we uh, look at the reactivity of certain of those leachables uh, that we see, um, we have seen reactions with small molecule APIs. We have seen reactions of leachables with excipients or with other ingredients or impurities of excipients or ingredients. And we also observed um, reactivity with uh, some therapeutic peptides, for instance, insulin or uh, proteins. Um, typically, it are the uh, electrophilic uh, leachables that will react with nucleophilic uh, functional groups of, for instance, peptides or proteins. And what will um, the compounds that you uh, encounter most and will lead to uh, reactions very frequently are those uh, halogenated uh, rubber oligomers, the bromyl uh, butyl rubber oligomers or the chlorobutyl uh, oligomers. Uh, they are considered as alkylating agents. They are very reactive. And um, let's say in 80% of the cases, if you see reactivity from a rubber stopper, it will be about these compounds. And now I will show you some examples here. So this is an example that we saw with a small molecule API, um, where there is that functional group. You can see that at the bottom where there's a thiodiazole functional group uh, pending on the drug product. And what you see is that um, an adduct was formed um, either with the C13 brominated um, oligomer or with the C21 brominated oligomer. Um, we also saw some interaction with glycine, which is an excipient. It's a bulking agent where the acid functional group reacts with the um, C21 oligomer to form an adduct again. But we also saw it with uh, another excipient, like uh, polysorbate, where uh, an impurity, or it, later on it could be an, an, an degradation compound, uh, uh, which is a fatty acid, typically stearic acid in case of uh, polysorbate, may react with also the C21 oligomer, brominated oligomer, and form an adduct. However, the biggest concern is the interaction with therapeutic peptides and proteins. And uh, here I would like to refer to a review article that was written by uh, Kim Lee and co-workers of uh, Amgen, uh, where they did define um, 
different reaction mechanisms that could take place between the electrophilic leachables um, or the electrophilic functional groups of a leachable with some nucleophilic functional groups of the protein. And that is a nucleophilic substitution reaction, an aromatic nucleophilic substitution reaction, Michael addition, acylation or ship based formation. We also did some uh, R&D work here at Nelson Labs in Belgium to see what was predicted in that article, if it really would take place. So we selected a number of uh, leachables where we looked at um, the structure and um, found that one of those functional groups could be elect electrophilic and we um, did the experiment with a lyophilized uh, insulin, glargine, glargine, and we could detect that uh, in all of those cases that an interaction took place between those reactive leachables and the uh, lyophilized glargine. If you would like to find out more about the work that we did, there is uh, a link to a web webinar that we did uh, earlier this year that explains a little bit more in depth on the experiments and the uh, uh, prediction of reactivity of certain leachables. Now, um, the question now is, those reactive leachables, is that something that is a nice to know information or is it really relevant? Um, and here I would like to refer to the uh, FDA guidance uh, for industry on uh, immunogenicity assessment for therapeutic proteins. And in uh, paragraph eight of that document, it is stated that leachable materials from the container closure system may be a source of materials that enhance immunogenicity, either by chemically modifying the therapeutic protein or by a direct uh, immune ad adjuvant activity. So, they specifically refer to a chemical modification that could be a trigger to induce immunogenicity into a patient when treated with therapeutic proteins. And the text goes further. Um, so uh, they also define what you need to do in terms of ENL uh, qualification to see if this kind of reactivity could happen. Could happen. So they define that comprehensive extractable and leachable lab assessments uh, with using multiple techniques uh, should be performed to assess the attributes of the container closure system that could interact with and degrade the protein therapeutic proteins. So um, here it's clearly stated that you need to investigate that. Um, the question is how do you do that? because typically for a leachable study, you're performing a targeted analysis, uh, zooming in on those extractables that were identified as potential target for leachables. If you only do that, you will never come across those reactive leachables or the leachables that have reacted. So you need to include a screening step. And that's why a screening step for LIO products is so important. Now, how to minimize the interaction between the lyo cake and the stopper? Um, like I said before in one of my previous slides, the um, mechanism of outgassing will really depend upon the quality of the rubber. If you have an older grade rubber, um, it may contain more ingredients or more impurities and at higher concentration. And that is represented with this chromatogram here, where the upright chromatogram represents an old rubber, where you can see it has much more peaks and the peaks are higher. That means much more compounds and higher concentration in the rubber. With a new rubber, you see that the number of compounds is substantially reduced and also the concentration in the in the rubber is, con is substantially reduced. Another way of uh, avoiding that kind of outgassing interaction is uh, using coated rubbers. Um, coated rubbers mean that uh, there's a significant step improvement in 
ENL terms. Uh, so um, the um, barrier effect of the fluoropolymer polymer uh, makes sure that the uh, interaction between the rubber and the lyo product is minimized. Um, there are two options. Either you have film coating, where only the drug product uh, side is coated, uh, and you have spray coating, where um, the complete rubber is uh, coated all around. But in any way, it may help you, may assist you in reducing that kind of interaction. Now, um, here it is represented with the same type of rubber grade, what a, a coated rubber extractable profile will look like and an uncoated rubber. So it's the same rubber, only the one has a coating, the other one does not have a coating. So you can see that here at the level of an extraction study where you use very ag aggressive conditions that you can see that the number of peaks and the um, concentration of those compounds has substantially reduced when you're using coated rubbers. So uh, when you would consider, if you would be alarmed by this presentation, you would say, no, uh, we need to do something about that, but you can reduce that interaction uh, by uh, taking clean rubber grades or coated rubber stoppers. What I would suggest is to include an extraction profile of a rubber and mainly uh, for volatile and semi-volatile as a, some kind of critical quality attribute in your rubber so, uh, stopper selection process. Now coming to the key learnings of that presentation. Um, first, I would like to reiterate that the regulatory need and depth of performing uh, an ENL qualification is ambiguous. The interaction mechanism between the LIO drug product and the rubber stopper is not based upon a direct contact mechanism, but it goes through the mechanism of outgassing. That outgassing that takes place uh, over a longer period may lead to some kind of accumulation of leachables, which will be mainly volatile and semi-volatile compounds which will be absorbed onto the lyocaid. Not only uh, will they be absorbed, but they may be also reactive to the drug product, the API, or one of its ingredients. Adding a screening step uh, to your formal leachable studies may allow you to evaluate the occurrence of those uh, leachables or the, the reactivity of those leachables. And it can assist in mitigating the risk of the occurrence of immunogenicity through uh, chemical modifying uh, the uh, therapeutic protein. And then the last point, um, I would um, um, advise to consider also um, to take the right rubber quality for your lifelized uh, container closure system. For more educational uh, material, um, I would like to refer to the Nelson website. You find a lot of information on sterility testing, biocompatibility testing, um, combination products, uh, and what, what is needed there, um, extractable and leachable testing, and so on and so forth. You will find webinars, uh, white papers, uh, videos, and so on. But I would like, like also to refer to the uh, Sterigenics website, our sister company. Uh, that website also contains uh, a wealth of information when it's about uh, sterilization and sterility assurance. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and open the floor for questions. Well, thank you very much, Pete, for that informative presentation. Before we get to audience questions, just a quick reminder that our audience members can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which they can find on the right-hand side of their presentation window. So here's our first question. Uh, during the freeze-drying cycle, a vacuum is applied at low temperature in order to remove all water through sublimination. 
is it possible to loosen some of the volatile organic organic compounds, uh, for example, from the rubber during this vacuum cycle? Well, I I, I would like to first uh, answer in general terms. Of course, if you apply a vacuum uh, to any material, you will um, evaporate all the volatile compounds. That is something, for instance, that you will definitely see if you study the uh, life-life struct product and you would compare it to um, re um, uh, a blank solution, for instance, that is uh, simply uh, that are the ingredients that are put together um, and uh, brought into solution, you will see that the content uh, of the volatiles is lower in the life life drug product than in the um, flesh, freshly prepared blank. So that is definitely what you observe. Uh, the question now is, will the level of um, volatiles and semi-volatile compounds in the rubber will those levels be substantially reduced by um, the freeze drying cycle. Um, well, it is possible. We have never studied this, but still, there are is there are too many compounds, and the concentrations of those compounds is too high to see a substantial reduction. And you'll see eventually all those compounds still coming out, regardless uh, of of the length of the of the uh, freeze drying cycle. So uh, yes, you uh, you will see them. Of course, that may be an opportunity for the rubber manufacturers to look at, you know, reducing the volatile compounds by uh, by um, applying a vacuum, you know, as some kind of extra cleaning step. But this is uh, out of the scope of this presentation. Okay, thank you. Here's our next question: Is there a rubber extractable database? Well, no, uh, there's no such thing as a specific um, rubber extractable database. Um, of course, um, most of the people who know uh, Nelson Labs and know the work that we did um, know that we have a database of uh, over uh, 5,000 compounds with analytical data, with mass spectra, with retention times, and a substantial part of those compounds are in the database of Nelson Labs. It's a it's a database that is um, across different uh, analytical pr platforms: uh, 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 Headspace, GCMS for volatiles, GCMS for semi volatiles, and then the uh, Executive uh, or the Q Executive Accurate Mass uh, platform for uh, non volatile analysis uh, for LCMS. Um, so yes, we have one. Is there one that is publicly available at Halo at this point? All right. Um, once once the extractable study is done, is leachable study still needed? Um, well, I'm not sure if this question is um, related to life life structure or more a general question. When I would have had that question or received that question 10, 15 years ago, I would have said um, no. If you perform an in-depth extractable study with different solvents and different uh, extraction conditions and so on, and you do a thorough uh, assessment of these extractables and you do a, a, a safety assessment on them, it is sufficient. That is the situation, was the situation 10, 15 years ago. Now, it is mandatory to perform a leachable study, regardless of the, um, of the dosage form that, uh, that is um, being investigated. Um, so certainly for parental application, it is an, it's it's mandatory to perform leachable study. Um, yes, so my my answer is yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so does the, does extreme vacuum affect the rubber stopper and its impurities during lyophilization? Um, Well, yes. Yeah. Um, so um, during um, during the storage uh, of the lyo container, there's of course um, uh, a nitrogen uh, atmosphere in the in the vial just to uh, protect it from ingress, uh, oxygen ingress, and also protect it, you know, from oxidation. Um, there's a small uh, vacuum, something like 200 millibar, typically uh, in the vial, and that, of course, additionally, you know 
may um, um, lead to uh, additional outgassing. So yes, it is possible that uh, the outgassing is supported by this, the, the light uh, under pressure in the pile. Okay, thank you. Here's the next question. It's a little long. Um, you explained in great depth that the react that reactivity that is observed for lyophilized drug products with certain certain leachables. But at the same time, you also indicated the issues that exist to find the right blank drug product for lyo drug products for this type of evaluation. Would it not be possible to look at the extractables data to see which compounds could potentially react with the drug product? That is a good question. So um, if I understand it correctly, so what you typically do in a leachable study is you zoom in on the compounds that you found in an extraction study, and that is the basis to, uh, for the focus of uh, your attempts to, to do a leachable study. You focus on those compounds that you have identified in an extraction study, uh, to quantify them in a leachable study. Now the question is, could you, if you zoom in on those compounds uh, of the extraction study, could you also assess the reactivity? of those compounds, you know, knowing that uh, some of the functional groups may be electrophilic and that they will react with nu nucleophilic uh, groups uh, of, the, of the drug product. Well, yes, that's something you can do um, and something that we have investigated. So we, we have built a model in that respect where we can predict uh, of all the compounds that are in our database of, of uh, more than 4,000 compounds we can predict reactivity, and that's actually the basis of uh, um, the R&D work that we have done and uh, that I talked about uh, earlier in the slides. Uh, we were able to um, um, check what we predicted with that model uh, with uh, some experimental data with uh, glargine as uh, insulin as, as the, uh, the marker compound for reactivity. So yes, I mean, there's a way to predict it. All right, thank you. Next question. Does the vacuum in the Lyo vial play a role in the outgassing mechanism of the rubber stopper? Yes. So I, I think I kind of uh, answered that question already. So the, 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 the vacuum that is in the Lyo, Lyo vial will um, additionally assist in the outgassing mechanism and will do a higher, higher outgassing and uh, a higher assimilation of uh, compounds onto the lyocate. Okay. All right, thank you. We have time for one more question, it looks like. So do you think the leachables and extractables are more of a hazard in biological products or chemical products? Um, I think um, you have to make the distinction between uh, will they react and uh, what the consequence will be. I think um, the reaction potentially um, of um, some of those leachables that may be reactive, and I'm mainly thinking about those uh, oli uh, oligomers, the uh, halogenated oligomers, they will react with both. Um, however, the um, safety consequences for biologics is, from my perspective, substantially higher than for uh, small molecules. Uh, because of the uh, fact that immunogenicity potentially may uh, occur, and that have, can, can have uh, severe consequences. All right. Well, thank you very much, Pete, for your presentation and for taking the audience questions. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. I want to thank the audience for attending and participating in this event. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Nelson Labs, for making today's webcast possible. Audience members will receive an email alerting them when this webcast will be available for replay. And I invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. So thank you again for joining us, and have a good day.